Welcome to the third or possibly fourth or three and a half, third and a half session of our safeguarding conference in um, the Northeast uh, and Yorkshire. We are delighted, we were so delighted with the success of our conference last year that we decided to do it again uh, this year, but do it slightly differently over three days rather than six days. So we're primarily gathering today from the five districts, Sheffield, Darlington, Yorkshire North and East Newcastle and Yorkshire West. Although I do know that we have folk joining with us from around the connection and it's really good to have so many of you here. Just to introduce the conference team, the brains behind this afternoon and all that we've been doing this week. We have Alison Hill, who is the DSO for uh, Sheffield, Katie Spencer Madden, the DSO for Yorkshire North and East. And we have a huge thank you working in the background to Catherine, Sam, Sean, Elliot, and Kira, who are our tech comms and publicity team for the week. Without their work, none of this would be possible. Um, I'm Carolyn Godfrey and I'm the Regional Safeguarding Officer covering the Darlington District and the Newcastle District. Uh, a few points of housekeeping before we go further. Again, if you're just joining us and you're having issues with your sound or video, I might suggest you go out of the meeting and come in again using the Zoom link rather than coming in through Eventbrite, because that seems to be resolving that issue. Please remain on mute during the, the main session. That helps to prevent background noise and any echoey feedback. You can go off mute when we're in the breakout rooms, which we will be using later, because at that point, it's good to talk to one another. We also have the chat function, and it's good to see folk introducing themselves using that. Um, feel free to drop any questions while um, the session is going on that you might want to to ask and we will be keeping an eye on that and there will hopefully be opportunity at the end to pick some of those up some of excuse me up some of those questions we're recording the sessions and the links to them and any additional documents will be made available um, in um, in the next week or so I have in my notes as part of my introduction to say that we hope that the tech will run smoothly and thank you in advance for your patience if there are any hiccups. Um, as those of you who try to join us on Tuesday will know, we aren't having the most technologically smooth week so far. So again, in advance, thank you for all the prayers and thank you for all the patience. We had a good session this morning with Tim Carter, even though it had to be rescheduled from the slight disaster that was Tuesday. But we do hope that everything will go smoothly this afternoon, but we do thank you in advance for your patience if it doesn't. Um, I'm going to, to, to start us off, I'm going to hand over to um, the Reverend Stephen Lindridge, the Chair of the Newcastle District, to lead us in a time of devotion. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Carolyn, and it's great to be with you this afternoon and uh, great to see so many of you here. I'm just going to share with you some words from the lectionary that's going to be chosen for um, this coming Sunday from Luke's Gospel. It's a very familiar story. Uh, just one or two reflections that will come out of that uh, around, obviously, our theme this afternoon. So Jesus, once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, the crowd was pressing in on him. Uh, to hear the word of God. He saw two boats there on the shore of the lake and the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, uh, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put it out a little way from the shore. He then sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let your nets down for a catch. Simon answered, Master, We've worked all night, all night long, but caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they'd done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signalled their partners in the other boat to come out and help them. And they came and filled both the boats 
so that they began to sink. When Peter, Simon Peter, saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they'd taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching people. And when they brought their boats to the shore, they left everything and followed him. You might think that's kind of uh, a strange uh, passage to pick, uh, particularly when we're thinking about forgiveness. But in a sense, there's several things that, that, uh, that strike me. Um, not least, this is the, the, the kind of the beginning of, um, well, we've tried that, but it didn't work, <laughs> um, from which all of the kind of um, uh, sort of comments kind of come. Um, as Peter says, well, we've been out all night, Lord, um, but because you say so. But the thing that strikes me most uh, around this is Peter's own self-awareness, which is often one of the things that is a, a resonant thing around the nature and the complexity and yet the simplicity of forgiveness. And the fact that he doesn't come to Jesus's feet, he comes to Jesus's knees. So Jesus is obviously seated and he comes with this words of go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And in the heart of all of uh, what we're going to think about this afternoon with Leslie in the complexity of forgiveness and yet sometimes the simplicity uh, and knowing the different ways that affects us. Uh, I found this self-revelation, which is often where sometimes forgiveness begins in whether we need to give it or whether we need to receive it, um, is about knowing who we are before uh, the situations that we face. But Jesus, in the face of Peter, uh, says to him, don't worry about all of that. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. May we hear the words of Christ speaking to us in the midst of this session of forgiveness. Uh, don't be afraid. And may we also know God with us as we talk and think and pray through all of the issues of forgiveness around the issues of safeguarding. So let's pause and pray now. Gracious and loving God, we thank you in all the scenes of life you are with us. And we simply ask your spirit to surround our conversation, our understanding, our thought and our listening. We pray for Leslie as he brings to share the reflections on forgiveness. And for us all, Lord, as we think and talk through these issues, as it may trigger all kinds of things, uh, it may stimulate and challenge. But help us, Lord, in the midst of all of that, to know that you walk with us, helping us every step of the way. And may we hear the words of Jesus saying to us, do not be afraid. For the sake of your coming of the kingdom and for your glory, Lord, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Stephen. The trigger to our thinking, as, as those of you who've been in previous sessions, um, the trigger to our thinking for the conference this year was the Theology of Safeguarding report that went to the Methodist Conference last summer. Um, it's a, a, a good report um, and we will be sending out the links to the link to it. Um, with the material at the end of this week. Um, and, and like I've mentioned and some of the speakers have mentioned this week that we can often shy away from the word theology um, and, and think, well, I feel like that anyway, think that that's quite often something best left to ministers. But, but I, I think from reading that report and from the sessions this week, they, that some of that, that fear factor has been removed. That this is that there are things in that report that are challenging to us and things that we can learn from. And this week we're looking that we've been picking up some of the themes from that report um, and un unraveling them a little bit and, and seeing how they apply to us in the roles that we have in the church and in our day to day church life. 
as with many issues that we discuss and many issues around safeguarding, the topic that we're discussing this afternoon can trigger some challenging thoughts and emotions. We are acutely aware of this. And we would ask you please to take care of yourselves. If you find that you need to speak to someone as a result of what we're looking after this afternoon, please turn to a trusted friend, talk to your minister or talk to your DSO. Don't hold this yourself. This afternoon, we are going to be looking at the topic of forgiveness um, and where that is talked about in the, the report. And we are delighted to have Reverend Le Leslie Newton with us this afternoon to lead our session. Um, for those of you who don't know, Leslie is a presbyter, Methodist presbyter, and he is the chair of the Yorkshire North and East District. He will be a familiar face to many of you, and we are really pleased um, that he is with us. And he's going to walk through this, this often very challenging topic. And we're, we're glad that he's been willing to do this because I know it's quite a difficult one to start to unravel. We really appreciate your willingness to lead our session and we look forward to all that you have to share with us. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, thank you, Carolyn. Uh, just check people can hear me. Yeah, great, excellent, good. Better than wittering on for half an hour and then finding out no one uh, could hear a word I'd said. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Yes, um, thank you, uh, Carolyn, for the introduction. And uh, I would just want to amplify the thanks, I think, um, um, in case it hasn't happened elsewhere in this conference, and I'm not sure it has, just a, a thanks from the districts to our district safeguarding officers who, who do a phenomenal job on our behalf, uh, day in, day out, week in, week out. And uh, I think we're incredibly blessed by the team of safeguarding officers that we've got. And, uh, and they've put a lot of work into this conference as they put a lot of dedication into everything. So um, I just wanted to say that as a district chair within the region, we're really grateful for all that you do. Um, and yes, this afternoon, we're going to look at the theology of forgiveness uh, with uh, all the caveats uh, that Carolyn has quite rightly raised about what a, uh, a difficult uh, issue it is and what a sensitive issue it is. So I was really grateful for Carolyn just um, highlighting that um, because I'm aware that as we, as we go into some of our conversation about forgiveness, about, about how we might give forgiveness and how we might receive forgiveness, it could be really quite a tricky ground for, for some folk. And, uh, and so um, do take care of yourselves and do seek out someone to chat with. Uh, and I hope that I won't be insensitive in, in anything that I offer this afternoon. That's certainly not uh, what I want to do. Uh, why on earth uh, would it be my lot to talk about the theology of forgiveness? Uh, I'm not quite sure. I sit here, um, my qualifications, I think, are only that I'm a grateful recipient of forgiveness and that I'm a learner in the art of forgiveness. Um, and, and I don't want to pretend for a minute that this afternoon what I'll be offering is anything like the last word in the theology of forgiveness, but hopefully I'll be offering some first words as we look at the theology of safeguarding report and what it has to say about forgiveness. Uh, and together, perhaps we can have some good conversation that will just uh, highlight for us some things that we can take away from uh, this afternoon. But I want to start by affirming just how deeply forgiveness is part and parcel of how we make ordinary everyday life happen, how we make it sustainable. Just imagine for a moment if we didn't have the normal ability and indeed a routine willingness to offer and to receive forgiveness, how hard our relationships would be if every small irritation, error, oversight, or even thoughtless act was rendered unforgivable. When I was about seven uh, and a little uh, slightly overweight lad in short pants at Rylands Primary School in Lancaster, they had a scheme where parents would be on a, a rotor to staff the little library that we had. And when it was your parent on duty, it was your duty to go at playtime and get them a cup of tea. When my mum came in for her rotor duty, guess what? I completely forgot and went out to play. I didn't remember until I got home and I opened the front door and I realised that the temperature, temperature had just dropped about 10 degrees. My mum had been 
significantly embarrassed by my absence and she was disappointed in me uh, and she let me know all about it for quite some time it felt like um, but then of course uh, forgiveness unsurprisingly we might say and thankfully um, thankfully of course now it's not a sore area that we can't delve into indeed it's one of those family stories that gets told quite often we laugh about it and um, I feel liberated I'm pretty sure that my mum now age 91 isn't caught up in a regular angst about it all it's gone it's not forgotten but now because of forgiveness it's recast as a humorous episode now, Jill, my wife, could also at this point quickly pitch in by pointing out that there are still some mornings when I forget to take her a cup of tea, um, which reminds us that this sometimes needs further work. Uh, so just imagine if we weren't accustomed to being naturally a forgiving and forgiven people. What household could survive? What friendship, marriage, workplace? could thrive. The grudges would be piling up, wouldn't they? And, and eventually their weight would smash every relationship apart. And sometimes that's what happens, I guess. I, I have a friend whose wife cited in the grounds of divorce uh, that she was too irritated by how he ate his apple. Uh, which just begins to open up for us this, in this discussion at the rightful place, I guess, of, expe of expecting change behaviour in the arena of forgiveness as well, but we'll come back to that later. So as I say, it's part and parcel of how we do life, of how we sustain relationships. It is, if you like, part of the WD-40 for relationships, that we can be forgiving and we can be forgiven. And for us as Christians, we recognize too, don't we, our absolute human need to be receiving as well as giving forgiveness. That's why a prayer of confession is a standard, essential building block in our times of worship, seeking to restore and to be renewed in our relationship with God. Though perhaps sometimes that part of our corporate worship can be in danger of being somewhat more symbolic than transforming. I don't know if I'm being on dangerous ground here, but I'm aware of two dangers when I'm part of a congregation and a worship leader says, we'll now keep a moment of silence as we think about all the ways we failed God this week. Firstly, the blank mind. Do you ever have that? It's uh, absolutely not that there's nothing to recall, it's just that that particular moment, I can't think of anything more than I forgot to put the recycling out. And then the guilt, why can't I think of anything else? If only I could phone a friend, they'd be able to fill in the blanks. Um, and the other danger, the worship leader says, we'll now just have a moment of silence as we think about all the ways we've failed God this week. And then two and a half seconds later, they say, and now having laid all of that before God, we thank God for his forgiveness. And I'm like, hold on, I need far longer here after the complete travesty of, of the week I've just had. But in the sweet spot, how precious it is to be in worship and to be able to come to God as we know that God is coming to us and that we can be real before him and we can know his spirit and his grace pouring forgiveness over us in response to our faltering but sincere sorry. What healing and forgiveness and wholeness we can find from God in that space. So thank goodness um, for the gift and the healing of forgiveness, that, that ordinary in the everyday routine of life forgiveness that means we can stay in good relationships, that we can let go of grudges and guilt and that we can move on, that we can say sorry and mean it and sometimes but not always do better in the future but that the forgiveness can be offered and received. Relationships, trust, wholeness restored. As I say, the WD-40 of so many normal and ordinary 
relationships. And thank goodness, thank God for that opportunity to affirm and know God's forgiveness of us. And all of that enables us day by day in the normal and the ordinary to know we're forgiven by each other, by God, and therefore we're more able to forgive ourselves. So far, so good. But there's a but, isn't there? There is a but. And the but, of course, is that this whole theme also has its enormous challenges. Next slide, please. Oh, yes, next slide. And the next slide. Thank you. Great. But then, because although we can rely and be thankful truly for the ordinariness of forgiveness in the ordinary, the challenge is to think about how we respond and act in those times that are not ordinary and when the normal operating systems can't cope. So when a bomb explodes in a relationship which push, pushes trust to breaking point and with it all that the relationship was built upon, that means that the relationship no longer stands on common safe ground. When one person abuses another physically, emotionally, sexually, spiritually, however, sometimes over a long sustained period, or in a significant horrific moment, and the scars go so, so deep, and the scars can be physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual, or a traumatic mixture of all of them. Or in a church when a, someone in a position of leadership or responsibility abuses their role. And a child, a young person, a vulnerable adult, in fact anyone, is hurt. All these points um, are points at which we're way beyond the normal operating system, aren't we? And we therefore need to find ways to tread so carefully as church, as the people of God, about what we say to each other about these circumstances and how we set in place patterns of life that can take seriously the consequences of very significant long-term harm. We need to tread so carefully about how we talk about God's offer of forgiveness and how that can be both gladly and wholly embraced but also incorporated and lived out within a community that's committed to the safekeeping and healing of all. And it's within this church context that we're going to focus our thinking for a little while now. Um, next slide, thank you. Thinking about forgiveness beyond in the ordinary and navigating our way through our celebration of the wonderful gift of forgiveness on the one hand and creating a safe and healing space for those who've experienced abuse and harm. Uh, and our grappling with this will I'm sure also speak into relationships beyond the church, but, but we'll keep our thinking primarily located within the challenges uh, in the church uh, just for now. Um, so firstly then, to remind ourselves and to celebrate something of the nature of the community that we seek to be as church, uh, next slide please. So this is a, a paragraph from the Theology of Safeguarding, which is a, a, a rich way of defining uh, what the church is seeking to be. The church's witness to God through Jesus Christ involves its seeking to be a community marked by love and care for one another and for all whom it encounters. Christians believe that God wants human beings to flourish and grow in loving relationship with one another and with God. Note that for all in the middle of that which is which is which is the wonder of the church and the challenge of the church isn't it w the wonder and the challenge of the for all uh, so next slide so here's the challenge for us how do we become a community that offers forgiveness to those who've done serious harm and is a safe and healing space for those who've experienced serious abuse and or harm it seems to me that's that's the sweet spot, if it's appropriate to use that phrase, that we're seeking to find as a church. How do we become a community that can do all of that uh, together? Uh, next slide. Uh, and as we dig into that, 
I think it's important just to be explicit in, in recognizing another deep challenge here of being able to forgive that which really feels like it's unforgivable. That's, that is a challenge, isn't it? As C.S. Lewis there says, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive, something, something really hard to forgive. Um, so that's one of the challenges that we've just got to note here, and we'll come back to that as we, we, we go through our thinking. But that is a real challenge, isn't it? How do you forgive when it feels like it's really unforgivable? And how do we handle that as a community? Um, next slide, please. In the year 2000, there was a report of the Methodist Church, the Church and Sex Offenders. And I thought I found this quote really quite helpful. Uh, just in, in summarizing some of the tricky ground that we're on here, we were greatly exercised, the report says, by the question as to how readily victims of sexual offences and survivors of abuse should be expected to forgive their abusers. This forgiveness has sometimes been bluntly commanded within the church, but to expect immediately immediate forgiveness has been pastorally unwise, grievously insensitive and unrealistic. In the long run, God calls us to forgive our enemies and his commands are for our good. In the short run, it may be both impossible and undesirable, though it may eventually happen almost as a byproduct at the end of a long, hard process of recovery. It may be quite wrong for an abused person to meet the offender again, and always wrong for an, an offender to try to coerce a victim into forgiveness and reconciliation. We, uh, uh, th th this is, you know, this is an example here about about sex offence and the implications of it. Uh, but I think that does speak into one of the things that we need to be really careful about, how we speak uh, and think about our theology of forgiveness, that to simply be saying to one another, well, of course you should forgive, just get on with it, can, can very often be such an unhelpful and unrealistic way forward. Um, so we need to be careful uh, not to imply of each other that we are failures if, in the face of challenging behaviour, we're not immediately able to forgive. Uh, and I think it's important to plant that there. I think we need to, to note it and, and be careful of that in the conversations that we have in our churches about how we handle forgiveness. Uh, so next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so the Theology of Safeguarding Report highlights three misunderstandings about forgiveness, and I thought it worthwhile as just uh, noting uh, that here. So the first one, forgiveness, the first misunderstanding, forgiveness involves forgetting behaviour that's caused harm so that past sin and behaviour is blotted out and the forgiven sinner can start again with a blank piece of paper. That's the first misunderstanding, the report says. Just, uh, just hold uh, with that, that sentence there just for a moment as you take it in. It involves the misunderstanding that forgiveness involves forgetting behaviour that's caused harm so that past sin and behaviour is blotted out and the forgiven sinner can start again with a blank piece of paper. And alongside that, I've put, uh, as with all of these three misunderstandings, a quote from Desmond Tutu, Tutu, it seemed um, that it was appropriate to do so. Uh, and if we have the next slide, we see the first quote that I've put there. Forgiving is not forgetting. It's actually remembering, remembering and not using your right to hit back. It's a second chance for a new beginning. And the remembering part is particularly important, especially if you don't want to repeat what happened. Again, just pause for a moment so we can take that in. Um, you see the delicate nuance that, that Desmond Tutu is pointing to there uh, about forgiveness and remembering uh, and still with the offer of new beginning, but, re but recognizing that that new beginning comes from the fruitfulness of remembering rather than just forgetting. I think it's, it's it's helpful, isn't it, to have some of the wisdom in, of Tutu put uh, in, in this 
thought, given all that work that we see as perhaps exemplar of how communities can work through difficult things in the tr truth and reconciliation work that they did in South Africa, and what that can uh, teach us about the hard work of, of genuine forgiveness. Um, so next slide again then, please, thank you. So uh, just going back to this first misunderstanding, as the report says, and I'm just quoting a little bit from the report, the language of renewal or a new start or of being, or of being washed clean is problematic if it implies that the past has been dismissed. Forgiveness does not negate the consequences of the past. The risen Christ still bears the scars of the cross. In the Hebrew scriptures, Israel's sins are constantly rehearsed for all to remember. Forgiveness does not change what has happened as if it never happened, but it does enable people to live in a new relationship to the consequences of the past. I found that really helpful uh, in thinking through this potential misunderstanding that we uh, sometimes live with uh, within our churches. I hope, I hope you do too. So there's that first misunderstanding. And then the second misunderstanding, next slide please, thank you. Um, forgiveness means the cancelling of debts and obligations. That sounds very tempting, doesn't it? <laughs> forgiveness means the cancelling of debts and obligations. So um, just again, putting this against a quote of Desmond Tutu, next slide, thank you. Forgiving and being reconciled to our enemies or our loved ones are not about pretending that things are other than they are. It's not about patting one another on the back and turning a blind eye to the wrong. True reconciliation exposes the awfulness, the abuse, the hurt, the truth. It could even sometimes make things worse. It's a risky undertaking, but in the end it's worthwhile because in the end only an honest confrontation with reality can bring real healing superficial reconciliation can bring only superficial healing. So he's pointing there to the real hard work to be done in, in making this forgiveness really have life and potency, isn't he? So if we just go back to go on to the next slide, thank you, um, and just see that second misunderstanding there, simply put for us, forgiveness does not mean then uh, cancelling the debts and obligations. I wonder how you're responding to this. I guess there may be some debate we want to have about some of that. Um, but the report goes on to say to us that giving and receiving forgiveness may well mean that an offender has a greater sense of obligation than before. And it's worth us thinking about that, I think. So think of Zacchaeus, who after encountering Christ, offered to repay four times over those he'd swindled, even though, though the law apparently only required it to be twofold. Um, so forgiveness should encourage the offender, if it's really deep-rooted, holistic, forgiveness should encourage the offender to take responsibility for the damage that they've caused and seeking to rectify the situation and to make restitution. So it's forgiveness that's uh, embodied in what happens next, isn't it? Um, so the example that the report gives is that they might pay for therapy <laughs> uh, to seek to help that person who they've wronged as part of the part and parcel and consequence of their forgiveness and there's a gosh this is a, a you know it's a hard thing to read but it's a really good example I think American pastoral theologian Mary Fortune who tells of a group of incest offenders in a treatment program whose powerful plea was this don't forgive so easily um, the treatment program that gave rise to this was uh, a program led by all Christians and they, they'd all asked their pastors 
for forgiveness and prayers had been said and they'd been forgiven and they'd been sent home. And all the offenders were saying was that this pastoral response was not helpful because it enabled them to avoid accountability for what they'd done. So we need to just clock, don't we, that second misunderstanding that we need to avoid, that misunderstanding that says forgiveness means the cancelling of debts and obligations. And as the report um, goes on to say, and I'll just quote a little bit here from the, the paper, repentance includes accepting responsibility for past actions and making oneself accountable to others, which includes behaving in ways which enable others to be safe. It's always the responsibility of those who abuse to change their behavior and changed behavior, not just intention is important. This includes the acceptance that there may need to be ongoing boundaries around the ways in which they participate in church life. This is more than about this is more about, this is about more, sorry, than risk assessment, vital though that is, but also about the particular ways of engagement that might represent and the ways in which they might impede the creation of safer space and the witness of the church. I think it's really important for us to, to be recognizing this and the, the, the sophistication in the best sense of that word of, of what's being called for here and what needs to be shaped within a community life if we're really going to avoid uh, falling into that second misunderstanding. The third misunderstanding, next slide, thank you. Uh, the third misunderstanding that we need to avoid that a person who's abused should be treated as wholly reformed and good. Um, you'll see there's a bit of overlap here between the three, but I think I think they make their points individually and well. The misunderstanding that a person who's abused should be treated as wholly reformed and good. And again, a, a tutu quote, just to put uh, alongside this. Next slide, thank you. Uh, Forgiveness is taking seriously the awfulness of what's happened when you are treated unfairly. Forgiveness is not pretending that things are other than the way they are, an honest appreciation of what's happened and what needs to be taken into account and what, what a true forgiveness will be uh, really about. Uh, next slide again, thank you. Uh, so this notion may cause significant further harm to those who suffered the abuse and it provides an unrealistic view of human relationships and Christian discipleship, doesn't it? If this is if this is the misunderstanding that we take on board, uh, that a person who's abused, and we've said the forgiven should be treated as wholly reformed and good. But forgiveness, of course, does not mean that previous patterns of behaviour have been left behind. Nor does it remove any risk of reoffending. Uh, for some people particular behaviours are pathological, the report says. Conversion does not stop people sinning. It doesn't cure abusive behaviour or the temptation to offend God's forgiveness. That forgiveness, of course, is also a call to a new life, radically different from the old. And for those who have, who, who have abused, a sanctified life includes the, an understanding that the ongoing impact of the abuse on the lives of others and a preparedness to limit the ways in which they participate in the life of the church in order to enable others to, set, to feel safer and to grow. The one forgiven, as we said earlier, the one forgiven needs to be taking responsibility and needs to be helped and supported to take responsibility for ensuring that life in the future will be different, not least by avoiding situations which put themselves and others at risk. Um, 
Now, in a more general sense than, than maybe that focus on, on abuse and, and sexual abuse, um, then we have to recognize every one of us, don't we, that forgiveness helps us on the road towards Christian maturity, but it doesn't suddenly place us at the end of our pilgrimage, not for any of us. So we're glad to be forgiven because it helps us on our journey. But we know, don't we, that in and of itself, forgiveness does not then make us uh, better just because we've been forgiven than we were before. Romans 7 is a great reminder to us, isn't it? When Paul says, I don't do the good I want to do. And that's our condition, isn't it? And so in offering forgiveness, God is saying to us something like this. I accept you totally, despite what you did and were, you and I are reconciled. In the wonder of Christ, I'm with you to rebuild your life and put the past right. By the energy of the Holy Spirit, alive, ne live now as a new person, be forgiving to and be full of hope. But there's that sense that the, the forgiveness needs to be seen in that context of God's desire for our mind to be growing in the mind of Christ and our lives to be growing in the shape of Christ. And so when we forgive each other, we too then are offering the human level of such goodness. So it seems to me it's these sorts of things that we're holding in tension as we seek to be a church community that handles well this whole arena of forgiveness. How are we a church community that handles forgiveness well? I think we have to recognize the tensions, um, the creative tension that we need to live with. And we need to take on board the fact that as a church community, we need to work at it. Every church community has needed to work at this. Um, the New Testament is full of passages that talk about a strong discipline for its members and its leaders. I'm not going to go into them now, but some of you will be able to quickly think of uh, passages. Uh, for instance, in Matthew 18, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 10, in 1 Timothy, we see places where the scriptures are telling us about the discipline and the order that needed to be created. So it's never been assumed that conversion to Christ so transformed the believer's character so as to make accountability and order unnecessary. On the contrary, and crucially, the discipline of a church community is meant to be an integral part of the church, uh, representing the fullness of the gospel. It's an agency of the gospel, is the discipline and the order of the church at its best. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you. And I just thought um, I would just press this a little bit further as, as the people called Methodists, uh, and to think a little bit about that great truth at the core of Methodist thinking and practice at our best, that, that so much of our life together depends on the grace of God. And uh, you'll be, for those of you who've been uh, Methodist for a, a good while, hopefully are familiar with these, these words, you know, and their thought, but it just occurred to me as I was preparing for this, uh, that, that thinking about it in terms of God's grace amongst us is a really rich way of thinking about it. So there's these waves of grace that we know of as, as Wesleyan emphases, prevenient grace, where God comes and finds us where we are and takes a hold of us and offers us um, the gospel. Um, and then that justifying grace that puts us right with God. So that forgiveness. So God is here as the great uh, agent, who, uh, the great agent of forgiveness, if you like, the one who forgives and finds us. And then the sanctifying grace of God, which is that lifetime's work that we embrace as the people of God to gradually, step by step, often two steps forward, one step back, work on our journey of becoming who we were meant to be, sanctifying grace. But these, this work of grace is, is this work that we seek to, to embody as, as a community together. Uh, our social holiness is about recognizing we can't do this on our own. We need each other. We need that community around us to be helping us. And then the means of grace, these things that God ordains, 
uh, to be the toolkit of us growing in grace, our life of prayer, of searching the scriptures, of being at the Lord's Supper, of fasting, of conferring. So many of these things to be done together in groups, but where there's accountability, where, and we, we talked about that last night, didn't we, the, the, the need for accountability, but the caution about the power dynamics in that accountability. But, but at its best, these means of grace are the means by which we embody what a full expression of forgiveness can be, the means by which as a community we embody what it is to be a, a, a whole and healing community. So next slide, please. Thank you, just as I, uh, I come to the end of what I wanted to share with you. Um, critical question for me as I was just thinking through this for today, how do we grow as communities that can be forgiving and safe places for all? Uh, and I'll be really interested in, in your thoughts on how we can uh, develop in that way. It seems to me that it's by holding these things together in creative tension. And I think the tension is almost bound to be always with us, but it needs to be a creative tension that we're working with. Firstly, in emphasizing the miracle of new life, of forgiveness, um, but never forgetting how hard change can be. In emphasizing the miracle of new life and never forgetting how hard change can be. And then in developing a safe place for all, never forget that God's renewing and forgiving power as supremely displayed on the cross is at the heart of our gospel and our life in community. I think we need to work <laughs> at keeping all of that together in a creative tension, a creative mix within our churches. And the danger is that we lean one way or the other. We lean to a simplistic understanding of forgiveness, which actually does no one any good. Or we almost uh, lose heart in the power of God's forgiveness. And we end up um, ceding completely almost, if I dare say this, to the cancel culture that almost says, well, you can't be any good in the future because of what's happened in the past. And we don't believe that, do we? We don't believe that. So it's how we hold all of this together. Uh, and I think, um, you know, that's what our safeguarding practice is seeking to help us to achieve. Uh, and, and it takes its place within our gospel sharing, our fellowship, our service. It takes place in all the midst of all of that is the holding together of these things. One final story just before I, uh, I close. Um, and it's a story that I just heard the other week and I thought, oh, I quite like that. So Michael Beck is an American Methodist uh, and he's very involved in the work of Fresh Expressions over in America. And uh, his testimony is that he had a really tough childhood and he ended up in prison with a drug and an alcohol addiction. Uh, there were some wonderful grace-filled encounters and moments that led Michael Beck in his prison cell to give his life to Christ. And he found forgiveness in that cell for so much. And he came out of prison and he found his way to church. And he says that he said to his pastor when he got to church with great exuberation, Jesus has saved my soul. And then he goes on to tell of the pastor's wise response, which I love. The pastor apparently said to him, well, that's wonderful. Hallelujah. I'm thrilled that Jesus has saved your soul. But it's the AA that will save your ass. It's the AA that will save your ass. And I just think that's great. Um, hallelujah. Jesus saves our souls. But it's the church when we truly make take it seriously our life together that can save our asses and keep us all safe and help us all to flourish forgiven renewed growing in the mind and the likeness of christ i think we should be absolutely convinced that none of this is easy but i think it's so worth being a part of the journey 
So there's a final slide, uh, which is uh, just uh, going to appear now. Thank you. Great. Uh, which was uh, my question, which you can choose to discuss or not in the breakout uh, rooms. What more can we do to grow as safe, inclusive communities shaped by God's desire to see everyone flourish through healing and forgiveness? Make of that question what you will or just... Uh, um, have a good conversation about uh, where you think I went far from the, the road of right thinking about the theology of forgiveness and uh, we'll look forward to some conversation. Um, so uh, who's in charge? Um, we'll go into breakout rooms. How long shall we do that for? Shall we have um, 20 minutes or something in breakout rooms? Is that all right, Caroline? Yep. Yeah. So by the wonders of Zoom technology, I think you're going to disappear into breakout rooms and we'll come back sometime around 22 for some final conversation then. Thank you. Just an opportunity now to um, have any comments, any feedback, any questions that you might have. If you want to use the raise hand function and then we'll be able to clearly see who might want to uh, feedback any uh, reflections that you might have. Or you can use the chat function. You can type anything in there and then I will read it out. So raise hand function or put something in the chat and then we will um, we'll read that out. Um, Mark, Mark's raised his hand. Can you hear me? Mark. Hello. Yeah. Uh, Mark Braithwaite. Um, speaking to you from Bristol, uh, but Circuit Safeguarding Officer um, in, in Middlesbrough and Chair of the Regional Safeguarding Group for uh, Darlington and Newcastle. Um, our group, uh, we discussed in particular, we thought that, that your contribution, Leslie, was excellent um, and we wouldn't want any of that content um, to be forgotten about to the extent that we thought it could be used as a, re a really good basis to be rolled out in perhaps a, sh a more abbreviated form as part of general delivery to local church services through through the pulpit or through other resources. Um, we thought that the, the three misunderstandings were, uh, were absolutely valid and the way that you explained it was very good. So to try and harness that resource and roll it out on a much wider basis will be our suggestion. Thank you. Uh, thanks, that's very kind, Mark. Um, ho hopefully that will happen through the, the connectional process because those three misunderstandings were, were a part of that theology of safeguarding report. So um, hopefully the connectional team will come up with something more eloquent, which will be uh, which will be helpful. But thank you, Mark. That's much appreciated. Thank you. And the, re the recording of this session will be available afterwards, so you can use it um, in, in other contexts um, as well. That would be good. Um, Rory, Rory's got his hand up as well. Thank you. I just Everyone. wanted to make a demographic comment. I, I was looking at the screen when we started. There were 57 of us. Nine of us are men. And I think that that's something that's worth pointing out. Um, two of those are district chairs, Leslie and Stephen, who are leading us today. And, and one was Graham Jones, who's learning network person and others who hold who wear hats anyway. But I just wonder how we reflect on that when yeah. we think about issues like this in the church's life, how much the conversation is dominated by uh, not dominated by it's the wrong, you know, but you understand what the demographics are completely skewed um, in, in that men somehow don't feel able to or um, or want to take part in a conversation about things that are intimate, personal, emotional, and consequential. Um, and I just make that as a comment to, you know, for, for the range of faces that we hear this afternoon. I find this kind of meeting very interesting when you look at how few men sign up to take part and engage. Yeah, thanks, Rory. Yeah, on the back of that, I had a conversation yesterday. We're trying to put up together a well-being group within the district, and we've uh, asked for people to to self-identify to be part of that group. And we've got one man and six women, I think, so far. So it's the same thing, perhaps, being lived out there. Yeah, thank you. Were there any? Um, I can't see any of the raised hands. Um, Just a comment in the chat about oh sorry keep oh oh there's lots popping in now okay there's lots in the chat about um, 
about the domestic abuse uh, and men. I think that's on the back of uh, Rory's comment as well. And we've got another raised hand. Hi, my name is Dion. I'm the Children and Young People's Worker for the West Durham Circuit. Um, it's just, I think sometimes I did raise about what our preconceptions are about who the abuser is and what they look like. And, you know, it's, it's women as well as men. Um, there's a comment on about um, domestic abuse and, and, and men. Um, I personally have someone I know who um, was at the hands, it was the mother who was narcissistic and abusive and the impact of that situation, you know, and how can we enable people who don't have a voice? It's not to diminish about domestic abuse against women in, in any way at all, but you know, we've come leaps and bounds in mental health, for instance, people can speak about that now, but how can we make sure that people will be you know feel that they have a voice if they don't even feel like that's acknowledged you know but we do have preconceived ideas about gender and um stereotypes etc yeah we do Dion. Dion. um yeah it's it's really difficult ground isn't it we we we, we all come at this partly shaped badly shaped shaped by who we are we bring our we bring our stuff into the room don't we and, it, and it's part of this work in progress that we are that we need to work at and it's so much about our awareness of, of what we recognize in ourselves and what we just have to be clear that we don't recognize within ourselves it's oh yeah it's thorny isn't it i could say a lot more words but they'd probably be similarly incoherent i think it's really difficult ground but we need but for sure the first step is just acknowledging that this is really complicated I'm complicated, you're complicated, we're complicated, and we need loads of grace to be able to handle all of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, just a few comments in the chat. Um, one group were discussing uh, whose job it is to forgive. Isn't this between the person and God? Our being inclusive, supported, is not reliant on our forgiving someone, nor is it distinct from safeguarding. Safeguarding can be inclu inclusive and supportive whilst also protecting. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Mm. Um, it's interesting what, what the people think. I think whose job is it to forgive? I think I think my understanding of scripture would imply that it's it's God and ours. <laughs> uh, you know, the Lord's Prayer and such like that that God forgives, but we are we are invited to go on the, at least that journey of seeking to forgive, even though we acknowledge in some cases it's really really hard. But we are we are. And, and then forgiving ourselves, which is something we didn't really spend long on in what I was talking about before, but that's that's how do we forgive ourselves sometimes? How do we do that? So whose job is it? I think it's it's every it's everybody and God's job, I think, I think. Um, but for me, the forgiveness thing, I, I don't want to lose sight. You know, you say you're quite right, Emma, you say our being inclusive, supportive is not reliant on our forgiving someone. No, it's not. Nor is it distinct from safeguarding. No, it's not. But there's something precious about forgiveness, isn't there? There is something absolutely precious, precious and life-giving and releasing about forgiveness, even though it's really hard ground. There is something really incredibly precious and in, at the heart of the gospel about forgiveness. Otherwise, we're just stuck with cancel culture. And I think that, that would be a dreadful thing. And I think part of the good news is how we balance all of this in such a way that we can still say, and God forgives, and we're going to try and be a forgiving community, I think. Emma, that's probably a really pants answer to your question, and I apologise if I wasn't even really addressing it. But... Thank you. Um, please continue to put your comments or uh, questions in the chat. Um, we're going to close very shortly, but if you if you do have any other comments, then please put them in there. Because what we will do, we will um, we will save the chat and we'll go through it later. And if there's anything we missed or haven't responded to, um, then we will put it in there. If you've also got any good sort of um, either 
books or resources or anything that you've read on this subject, again, put that in the chat, because what we can do is circulate that as well, because we recognise that um, we've given Leslie an enormous difficult task to discuss something like this within, you know, a, an hour and a half and deal with something like this. We recognise this is just the start of the conversation and that there's lots more to be gained from continuing to communicate about this uh, and to read about this and explore this as well. So anything you've got, then please uh, yeah, do put that in, in the chat and we will follow up on it. Um, we'll follow up on it afterwards. So we've mentioned that um, the sessions throughout this week as part of our regional safeguarding conference are all based on themes taken from our Theology of Safeguarding report. And we will circulate the link to the report. I know lots of people haven't had a chance to read it. Um, Catherine usually puts a link in the chat, but we'll also circulate a link afterwards. Um, a team has also been put together to look at this report um, and developing some resources to go alongside it so that it will make it, it's quite a long report, but hopefully the resources will make it easy to digest and they'll be able to um, be able to use those extra resources to discuss aspects of the report within our local churches because I think it's really important to not just have these conversations in this space but also take those conversations back into our local churches and contexts as well. Leslie thank you so much for being with us and sharing with us this afternoon. Um, what you have shared has been so powerful and thought-provoking. You've reminded us of that fundamental and simple nature of forgiveness in our everyday lives and relationships, but also that other aspect of forgiveness, that forgiveness that is costly, that forgiveness that causes great pain, it takes enormous sacrifice, and there are struggles and setbacks with seeking to forgive others because of the things that they have done, the harm that they've caused. And perhaps all of this offers is to look with a new vision about how we journey forwards with exploring forgiveness and healing and becoming safer communities. So we thank you for all your thoughts um, that you shared with us today, Leslie. If you do feel like you need support following this session, please do look after yourself. Please find somebody that you can trust to come find in. And if you don't feel that you've got people that you can talk to, please do message your district safeguarding officer who will be able to help. This session marks the end of our second regional safeguarding conference. And I just wanted to offer huge thanks to the team that have put everything together. It has honestly, it has just been such a pleasure to be able to work with really talented and enthusiastic and committed individuals from across all five districts and I pray that God continues to bless you in all of your ministries and I hope that we all get together to work on something again soon. So before we go from this space let's just have a moment of silence to just gather our thoughts and lift things that are on our hearts to God and then I will close uh, with a prayer before we leave this space. This is an Iona blessing. May God who is present in both sunrise and nightfall and in the crossing of the sea, guide your feet as you go. May God who is with you when you sit and when you stand, encompass you with love and lead you by the hand. May God, who knows your path and the places where you rest, be with you in your waiting, be your good news for sharing, and lead you in the way that is everlasting. Amen. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. I pray that you will have a blessed rest of the day and may God bless you in whatever plans you have. Thank you.